I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you in the name of Him who is above all names. And we are introducing today a course that is a part of the maturing process of each believer. My name is Paul Johansson, and uh, I've been married to my wife Gloria for 57 years. We have two children, four grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. My wife wanted me to say that, so we're in it together. We've lived in Kenya for a number of years and started a college in Nairobi, which is going on today, uh, and later we served for years as the president of Elam Bible Institute and College. I earned a master's degree from the State University of New York, and we have continued to teach in many different schools. I've ministered in conferences and seminars on all continents, and I've published a series of books and also recorded uh, video teachings in the book of Roman, Romans and Acts and Hebrews. My focus through the years has been to help students prepare a set of ethical principles and guidelines in order that they should be able to make godly decisions in their lives. Because we live uh, today uh, in an unholy world and we are forced to make holy decisions, we must have a more biblical understanding of what is needed uh, to live as a man or woman of God. I now present to you biblical ethics. Godly principles for successful living. May the Holy Spirit use this course to set His holy standard in the hearts of His children. Biblical Ethics. Section 1, which is the introduction. Let's start with the question that everybody asks. What is Christian ethics? A simple definition is knowing good from evil. In the world, that seems to be drifting without a moral conference, a co compass. Biblical ethics establishes a godly standard for Christian conduct. Let's keep that in mind. Christian or biblical ethics establish a godly standard for true Christian conduct. In this study, we define biblical ethics as the moral example and teachings of Jesus applied to the total life of the Christian empowered by the Holy Spirit. That, need, that bears repeating as well because it's on that definition that we build this course. That true biblical ethics is the moral example and teachings of Jesus applied to the total life of the Christian empowered or enabled by the Holy Spirit. Biblical ethics is not just a series of do's and don'ts, but principles and guidelines for successful living. Our definition of Christian ethics for Christian behavior <clears throat> is that we model ourselves after the true model Jesus Christ in our whole life. This is only possible for us by yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit. In this study, we will first define the highest good according to Scripture, and second, to establish the principles by which we can bring our lives, our behavior, into a godly lifestyle. That is the, the purpose of this course as we go forward. The Bible is the revelation of God's will for all human behavior. Isaiah 53, verse 6. It speaks this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's saying that 
really because of sin, man really has only one true eternal answer, and that is to turn to Jesus with his saving grace in his life. The way of successful living requires spiritual disciplines in all our attitudes and our actions. The ethics of the Old Testament are the laws concerning our behavior. The ethics of the New Testament focus more on our attitudes and our motives, out of which godly actions will show forth in all of our behavior. Righteous relationships must start from the heart. What you're going to see in this study as we move from the Old to the New Testament is that the Old Testament gives laws. Now a law is telling you what to do without giving you the power to do it. But in the New Testament, Jesus will speak of attitudes that come by the Spirit of God. He will enable us to do what the Spirit leads us into. You're going to see a difference between the Old and the New Testament. The ethics of the New focus more on our attitudes, out of which God will show forth through our behavior. So the, the objective of the, the course is to establish a biblical framework, a frame of reference. Just picture a frame. And in that frame, we are going to include certain subjects and, ty and topics that are going to be there. And from that frame of reference or toolbox, we're able to take out scriptural answers in order to draw scriptural or godly conclusions when we face different situations. Sometimes our conclusions and our ap applications to current issues may run contrary to the worldly way of doing things, contrary to society, but we're holding to the Word of God. We are not dictated to by society we are led by the Spirit in fulfilling divine principles of the Word of God. Remember when you were a child. Uh, you were leaving the house, maybe going to school in the morning, and your mother would maybe say goodbye to you and send you with a lunch. And as you left out of the door, your mother would say to you, Son, just be good. Just be good. Or to your daughter, the daughter who may be going out with some fellow or some guy. Or, the mother would say, be good. What does the word good mean? And it is the intent and purpose of this course to help us to define good according to God's way. That is the purpose of the course. Why should we study uh, biblical ethics? Well, in today's world... Uh, there tends to be a, a trend in the church that is to change its morals, to identify more with the worldly system, to adapt to the world. And as a result, for this reason, it is very important that present to present godly principles in this study of biblical ethics. The world conditions are becoming more permissive. That is, they allow for many things they did not allow for before. And moral compromises are being made by many churches. This has left Christians unsure of their moral position and the scriptural standing when it comes to everyday life and even in complex situations. It's important to give the reasons why we should have strong biblical foundation. We're building the foundation out of which we will build the house. We need more than stories. The Bible has many stories in it. The story of Samson, the story of Joseph, the story of Abraham and of Moses. Many stories, and they're good stories, and they're, and they're true stories that we take meaning from. But in Christian ethics, we are looking at the Word of God, to identify the principles by which we are to live. We can see principles that were violated in Samson's life. 
ethical principles that were violated. Samson, a man of God, went with a worldly woman. Violation of the Word of God. So ethics falls into it. It's not the stories we're looking at. It is the principles that issue from those stories. In today's world, first we need to have biblical ethics to stimulate our own growth. Uh, as believers, to study and sharpen our focus as we do <clears throat> when we study ethics on the Jesus model that God has placed before us. What he said and what he did were the same. His teaching and behavior were identical. Secondly, we need to have the study of biblical ethics in order to have the tools <clears throat> when we face complex situations and gray areas of morality. And we have a true scriptural understanding. Areas where right and, and wrong have been abused or have been conflicted. Thirdly, it is important that we get a hold of biblical ethics in order that when we are asked, especially if you are a pastor or even a parent, as a parent you're answering questions for your, your children. It's good to have ethics, biblical ethics, in order to have give them proper godly advice. So we're asked to give moral guidance with respect to the different situations that people are entering into or have already gotten into. Where there is no clear understanding of what is scriptural, we're tempted to water down and compromise and somehow just say it's all right and give them counsel that has not related to the Word of God. And fourthly, society has rejected, and this is important, society in general has rejected the concepts of absolute. That means that certain things never change. Things are either right or wrong before God, and they're always that way. No matter what culture or country or church we're in, with God, certain things never change. We already know that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we serve an unchanging God. This is important because especially when God says He loves us, and if we thought God was changing, some days we could think He's angry with us. But God will never change, and that is absolute with God. He is always loving us. We live in a world that now says things are relative, meaning everything depends on someone else or something else and is constantly changing. And, the, and there'll be more discussed about that in a future lesson. In our world, <clears throat> there are different standards. We know that. In early Greek culture, what was good was courage and justice. That was good. Uh, maybe other things were different, but that was the true good in the Greek culture. Through the ages, the only way to stay consistent with biblical principles, even though we must adjust to changing times and cultures, is that we, we establish a fixed point of reference. When ancient seamen would sail across the ocean, they found their way by fixing their sights on the North Star something that they knew would always be in the same place. If your point of reference is solid, that is, it's fixed, you will not drift. If it's moving and changing all the time because of the culture uh, is changing and its standards, a person can lose their way because their point of reference is not secure. It is not absolute, that point of reference. The Bible provides us with secure and proven godly principles which are good for us and have proven the test of time. To identify this 
North Star, this fixed point of reference. We must develop a transcendent orientation. Now this means that our reference point is outside of ourselves, outside of our culture, outside of our society. In fact, a believer who has this type of North Star will be able to sail through the seas of life and not be destroyed by the unseen rocks. Now, this frame of reference can be likened unto a toolbox which contains principles that give life answers to questions that are very difficult. Let's give ourselves an illustration here. There are three or four boats that are crossing the ocean. <clears throat> the boats are using radio communication between one another. And these two or three boats on this side, they talk about the direction. And, and one says to the other, I think we should go more to the east. And the other one said, no, we need to go a little more to the west. And so they discuss their direction. And they continue to proceed together only by how they feel they're making their way through the ocean. On the other side, there's one boat by itself. And this boat has a, a compass or has a, has a telescope fixed onto the North Star. Now that one boat has fixed to something that doesn't move. And because that doesn't move, the one boat can know where it is at. So here this one boat is going more to the east and the other boats are going more to the west. And the other boats say, listen, little boat, you need to come with us. You see, society, the majority, is going by how they feel is right. I think it's okay to, uh, to marry this person. I think it's good to be divorced. or I think it's no problem to have an abortion. That's the way the world is going. But over here, there is a boat that is focused on divine, unchanging principles. And these principles give this little boat the direction and this little boat will reach the destination far before any of the other boats if in fact they ever reach the definition because their destination is changing. Let's go this way. They're not sure where they're going. Even though there's more of them, they are less sure of where they're going than the one boat who is fixed on a certain point. I trust you hear this because we are establishing in this teaching the one point that can help you know how to direct your own life. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the frame of reference was the Ten Commandments. Uh, but we'll look in the New Testament as well at the life of Christ. Now, we're building the tools in the toolbox that we're going to take out. Principles from the life of Christ. Principles from the Ten Commandments. Principles from the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The message of the prophets and the message uh, that was given by St. Paul and, and uh, John and Peter and especially James and some of the other apostles. These together, these principles together, are a valuable resource and guide for life's uncertain paths. God has not left mankind without a guide. In fact, David said in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Watch what the word is doing. The word is giving you a place where you can watch the steps you take in your immediate surrounding. But the Word of God is also giving you direction for your future. So you are seeing the future and you're knowing how not to fall in the steps you are presently taking by the Word of God. You know, <clears throat> many Christians are not sure of many things, but when, when one lays hold of true Christian ethics... They have a clear 
and they have a clear frame of reference. That is, they have a, a toolbox that has answers. It's like driving your car, and you break down on the side of the road, and all you have is a simple screwdriver. And now you have a big problem. You only have one tool. But then there is another person driving down the road, and they have a toolbox. They have wrenches, and they have screwdrivers, and they have hammers. They have whatever they need to fix the problem that they would find while they are on the journey. <clears throat> we need to find a toolbox that will have the principles to help us resolve issues that we are presently facing, or if not us, our children are facing. Or if you are a pastor or Christian worker, the people you are leading need to have principles, not just nice little stories, but principles that are biblical in order to live a successful, godly life. A Christian who has these principles will have a number of things. One, they will have the tools they need for righteous principles that will enable them to be a true follower of Jesus Christ in both word and deed, inside and outside in behavior, putting it together. Secondly, a person who has the right grasp on biblical ethics will appreciate that their final obedience belongs to God and not to man. Now, by and large, there is no conflict. There is no conflict. And we'll talk about that in another chapter as well, where there shouldn't be a conflict between what God wants and what the government wants. But there are times that the government, or man's way, tries to usurp God's authority. And we have to go to God and say, Lord, you have the final say in my life. Thirdly, God is at work always on the side of right and good, and he is not on the side of evil. When things are right and holy and righteous, and there is love and there is compassion, there is justice, God is there. God is working that. Where there is wars, where there is evil, where there is abuse, where there is child abuse, or even the sex slave, the slave trade, all of these things are contrary to God's principles and violate the holy standard of God. Fourthly, <clears throat> one who has these principles will recognize that above uh, the kingdoms of this world, uh, there is the kingdom of of our God and of his Christ. And it says in Revelation, and he shall reign forever and ever. To know that there is a, a forever. You know, when you live your life now, you know that we will live with him. And our actions and attitudes in this life have a determining factor on the life that we shall live forever. Jesus said, He that hath the Son has life. That means, he said, that he shall never die. The life of Christ in us will never die. It is eternal life. And finally, if you have the right understanding of ethics, you will have faith that the sovereignty of God will give the believer the confidence that God will have the final word in all of the world's affairs. In fact, if you have a chance, you can look at it in Psalm chapter 2. It says that the heathen and the others <clears throat> are raging. They are raging. And, and they are saying something to one another in the second Psalm. They are saying, let us throw aside, let us break the bands of God. We don't need God in our life. They rebel against God. And so we can see the nations, even around us, much rebellion because all rebellion is primarily against God and what he wants in our lives. And they're talking in Psalm 2. But then listen to what God says. It says in Psalm 2, He that sits in the heavens shall laugh at them, and he shall have them in confusion, 
In other words, whatever you see on the earthly natural level, we must remember, and we will, if we have a handle on true principles of biblical ethics, we will remember that in the final, uh, the final uh, uh, end, God has the final say. And we can trust God to rise up and bring His rule, for He shall reign forever and ever. So having a frame of reference is very important. A toolbox. I don't know how many tools you have in your toolbox right now. And maybe some of the tools in the toolbox may have to be brought out and be cleaned up. As I, to as I, as I see sometimes uh, that there are things that, that people, uh, people learn in their house, learn at home, that, that may not be godly. And raised in a home, wonderful home maybe, but not with godly principles. So we have to be able to take certain things out and replace them with godly principles from the unchanging Word of God. Having this frame of reference then, when we live in this complex world with so many things coming at us every day, we will not be overwhelmed by anxiety and frustration in life. We will live with a conscious assurance that the presence of the Almighty God is with us and He's holding us in His loving arms. That is, our Heavenly Father is holding us. What a joy. Like a baby in the arms of its mother, God cares for you and wants you to be at peace and in relationship with Himself. Now remember, the difference between worldly ethical system and behavior and true Christian behavior is that the worldly ethics begins with human reasoning, whereas Christian ethics begins with divine revelation, that is, the Holy Scripture. So that as we wind down this first lesson, and as I wind it down, I want to talk to you about the way in which this revelation can be understood by a believer. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible said that you are in darkness because what you need is the light of the Son of God. A man came to Jesus in John chapter 3 and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you're a man sent from God, but because nobody can do these miracles, only God is with him. The man's name was Nicodemus. And he said, how can I get into the kingdom of heaven? In other words, how can I get a hold of what these, this biblical thing is all, all about? And Jesus looked him in the face and he said something to him that in the natural is hard to understand. He said to him, you must be born again. And of course the man was an educated man and said, do I have to enter again into my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, no. You must be born again of the Spirit of God. Now the reason I give you that scripture because it takes place early, early in the life of Jesus is because without being born again, it is impossible to understand the divine principles that God wants us to understand. These principles are for His children, those who are members of His family. And to be in the family of God, you must be born into the family. You might say, how do I get into the family of God? Well, you get into the family of God by simply saying, Father, I come to you. I am a sinner. Save me by the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for me on Calvary, and I received Jesus as my personal Savior. You can do that. If you're listening to this, this message, these lessons, I don't want to go any further and discuss what these are all about because you need the insights and the empowering of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand what the Bible is trying to convey to us in this lessons. So, as we end this lesson, I would pray that God of all grace will cause you to see that He hasn't given us a set of rules, do this, don't do this, do this, but He's given to us 
his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He is our model. We cannot be like him unless we have a relationship with him. He is the word, the word of God become flesh that we can understand it. John 1 verse 14. The gospel is the good news of salvation. It's not bad news. It's not that people are going to hell. It's that God has made a way for people to go to heaven and to dwell with him for eternity. He has opened up a way for the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of Christ. We are not called to simply act like Jesus, for His Spirit in us causes us to express His true likeness in all walks of our life. May God grant each of you a willingness to live by His divine principles for a truly successful life. It's only appropriate now that I pray for you in this first lesson in order that we might be able to walk together from here on in. Walk hand in hand. And so, in a moment, if you're there, I want to pray. Father, I ask you, for these that are seeing this lesson, that your Holy Spirit will bring them to a sense of godly conviction. If there are those among us that have not yet received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, right now in their hearts may they say, Lord, save me. I need a Savior. And by so doing, have the power of the Holy Spirit within them to give them the insight and to give them the power to fulfill the principles that will be laid out in this course. I thank you, Father, for those that are hungry for the Word of God. May you use them in their counsel and in their influence in others' lives. For we ask all of these in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. We say thank you, amen, and amen.